All right, welcome to our second Shira on Mashiach ben Yosef. And tonight we're going to finish the Marmakomos that we have here. But to refresh our memory of where we left off last time. So we discussed the fact that there are two Mashiachs. There is Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. The Mashiach that we classically call Mashiach, like the big Mashiach, is Mashiach ben David. When Mashiach ben David comes, it's game over. That's Mashiach. We get to a utopian existence where everyone follows one world religion. Mashiach is the king of the world, the undisputed ruler over the entire universe. And he has prophecy, prophecy returns, and everyone flocks to him to find out what is the will of Hashem. At that time, the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of God, and there'll be world peace. We said it's gonna be a very, very good time to be alive. However, before that, there is this mysterious individual known as Mashiach ben Yosef. And the Gemara says that Mashiach ben Yosef is going to die. The Gemara says Mashiach ben Yosef is going to die. So it doesn't say how, it doesn't say from what, but it says he's going to die. There are Midrashim, we didn't mention this yet, last time, they go into great detail about this final battle that's going to take place called Gog and Magog, and there's going to be this evil individual named Armilus Harasha, it actually says the name of the person who's gonna kill Mashiach ben Yosef. He's going to put a siege on Yerushalayim. All the Jews are going to gather in Yerushalayim and they're gonna be under siege until Armilus kills this person, Mashiach ben Yosef. So that is the, the basic game plan of the process. Now, Mashiach ben Yosef, again, it's not clear if it's an individual or if it's some sort of concept or process that's going to take place. So we saw that the Vilna Gaon says that Mashiach ben Yosef is a long process that really began already with Yosef Atzadik, who was kind of the forerunner of Mashiach ben Yosef, that's his Mashiach ben Yosef, and he laid the groundwork for the type of job that Mashiach ben Yosef is going to do. Yosef Atzadik came into Mitzrayim, and he went into the physical world. He became the CEO of the entire world, and he was almost a hidden tzaddik that was kind of setting up the Jewish people for the gullus that was going to take place in Mitzrayim. Right? That's what he did. He went down, he set them up, he set up Goshen, he set up the physical infrastructure for the Jewish people to survive in Mitzrayim. So Mashiach and Yosef is going to do the same thing in the opposite direction, right? Yosef Tzadik was setting us up for life in Gullus. Mashiach and Yosef is going to set us up for life post-Mashiach, for life in Eretz Yisrael after the ultimate Geula. So the Vilna Gaon was the first to really delve into this topic in detail. And he wrote a sefer that we gave the whole historical background last time called Kol HaTor, where the Vilna Gaon essentially gave a mission to his students to go begin the process of Mashiach ben Yosef. And he had the neshama, the gra had the neshama of Mashiach ben Yosef, certain Bechina. Again, Bechina means that he's in a certain level of Mashiach ben Yosef. He's part of that story. And at the age of 62, he went and attempted to make Aliyah to begin that process. He was denied permission from heaven. He went back and he sent his students, just like Moshe Rabbeinu sent Yoshua, who was also from Ephraim, which is the right, Bnei Yosef. So too, the Gra was denied permission, like Moshe Rabbeinu, and he sent his students to Tamide HaGra, so which the principal number one among them was Rabbi Hillel of Shklov, to go and to start this process of resettling the land of Israel. At the same time, there was also the Tamide HaBar Shem Tov, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of, uh, of, of Metepsk, that also was going to make Aliyah. So the first Aliyah was really the Tamide HaGra and the Tamide HaBar Shem Tov. So that was beginning, and both of them were mechaben to the same idea, to begin the process of Mashiach ben Yosef. Now there are other Hasidic Asfarim that speak about the fact that this was Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, that the Hasidim and Misnagdim were really two sides of the same coin, that uh, the Hasidim were Mashiach ben David and the Misnagdim were Mashiach ben Yosef, but okay, that's maybe for another time. But they both went at the same time to make Aliyah and to rebuild the land of Israel, to rebuild the Yishuv in Eretz Yisrael. When they got there, like we said, it was a totally barren place. There were 20 Ashkenazim and 9 Svardim, or I think maybe the other way around. Yeah, 20 Svardim and 9 Ashkenazim in, in the whole Yerushalayim. And they basically went there and proved that it was possible to live in Eretz Yisrael. Um, Rav Moshe of uh, the Hadarshan, Rav Moshe Rivlin, who was the grandson of Rav Hill Rivlin. So he stayed in Russia, in Shklov, and preached about making Aliyah and how amazing it was and to join his family that had already gone. And many people, many Jews started making Aliyah. And they started rebuilding the Yishuv in Yerushalayim. So that's what we were discussing last time. And we also went through some Midrashim in Chazal that speak about Mashiach happening, Kima Kima. 
just like the sun does not pop up above the horizon immediately because it would blind all the creatures. So if you look at dawn, it happens very, very slowly. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And almost when it's full daylight, the orb of the sun breaks the horizon, which we call nates. So too, Mashiach is going to occur in the same way. The world is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. Uh, the land of Israel will become settled. Everything will be set up. The table will be set. And then we invite Mashiach. And that's it. And then Mashiach kind of blows the neshama into the guf. So Mashiach ben Yosef is going to build the body, the body of Kal Yisrael, which is the land of Israel, which is Kibbutz Galios, we said, to ingather all the exiles. And then Mashiach ben David is going to blow in the neshama, and the whole world will recognize that a Baruch Hu is in charge. So this is this long process that began with the Vilna Gaon when he turned 20 years old. Because at 20 years old, he said the Vilna Gaon turned 20 in the year 5,500. 5,500 is 6 a.m., 6 in the morning, on the sixth day of creation, because every day of creation equals a thousand years, because every day for Hashem is a thousand years. So the 6,000 years of human history before Mashiach has to come, before the buzzer, corresponds to the six days of creation. And the last day, 6 a.m., on the sixth day of creation, was the year 5,500, when the Bilnagon turned 20 years old and began teaching Kabbalah. And every 42 years, or 41.666 years, uh, we move one hour further into the day, the, into the sixth day of creation, which means right now, I made you a little chart over here on the second page. We are at 12, I mean, yet last, last year was 12.42 p.m. 12.42 p.m. and the end of time is 6 p.m. So 6 p.m. is when we move into Olam Haba. We move into the 7,000th year, which the Gemara says the Olam will be charov, the world will be destroyed and rebuilt in that thousand year period. So we have a pretty short period of time left. So we're at 12.42 p.m. So obviously everything is, uh, is moving in the right direction as you see the land of Israel is growing. I think they say that the next Shemitah year is going to be a Daraisa. Shemitah for 2,000 years has been Darabana. Why is Shemitah, the halachas of Shemitah are Darabana? Because you don't have the majority of Jews in the land of Israel. Until you have the majority rove of Klai Yisrael in the land of Israel, Shemitah is a Darabanan. So right now, I believe we're at something like 47% of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. It's very, very close to 50-50. And they say that in seven years, especially the way things are going in Ukraine and France and Europe and all these places, so, and the population growth in Israel relative to the intermarriage in the rest of the world. So the majority of Jews, they say next Shemitah are going to be in the land of Israel, which is amazing. That means the Kedusha of Shvi'is, which is a big deal because Kedusha, we don't really treat Kedusha seriously because we don't know what it is, but it's a big deal that there will be Kedusha in the land of Israel on a Daraisa level. On a Daraisa level, which hasn't happened for 2,000 years. So if you want to say that Kibbutz Galias is moving in the right direction, that's a big landmark. Right? That's, a, that's, a, that's a big notch on Mashiach's belt to get to that point when we're at the majority of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. So that's happening very, very soon. And the Gemara says that Mashiach is going to come after a Shemitah year. It says Mashiach, Mashiach is going to come after a Shemitah year. So maybe this year? I mean, or maybe what? It could be this year, right after this year, it could be next, it could be after the next Shemitah, we have the majority of Jews in the land of Israel, but definitely we see things are moving. Okay, so I'm just trying to see where we, where we ended exactly last time. Okay, so that's pretty much where we ended off last time. That's our summary. So now we're moving into the discussion of modern events in Jewish history and trying to explain them within the Mashiach process. Namely, the two biggest events in the past hundred years which are, and there was a negative one and a positive one, the Holocaust and the establishment of the State of Israel, which gave Jewish people for the first time autonomous rule in the land of Israel and the first time in 2,000 years and the ability of everyone to move back, which is really the biggest thing that, that the State of Israel did. People think autonomous rule, that's not so impressive. The, the big deal was that it was very, very hard to emigrate to the land of Israel before that. Even after the Balfour Declaration, the uh, British pretty much uh, retreated on that, went backwards and, and issued the white papers, which made very, very strict quotas for who can enter the land of Israel. And they even turned back many Holocaust refugees, or refugees that were trying to flee the Holocaust, and they basically murdered them by sending them back to Germany or letting their ships sink. But it was very, very difficult to get into the land of Israel, which made Kibbutz Galias very, very hard. Right? That's very, very difficult. How are you going to get all the Jews to the land of Israel if the British are in charge and they're only letting 5,000 people in a year? So when the Jewish people got the land of Israel, the biggest deal was that they created the right of return. The right of return was, was, was an unbelievable chiddush in the world that the Jewish people were able to return to the land of, in, of Israel unhindered and with financial support. Right? There's something called the Sal Klita. So if you're living in all these terrible countries, 
and you want to come back to the land of Israel, you have automatic citizenship, and you have financial aid, you have absorption centers. That was a very, very big deal. That really encouraged a tremendous amount of Jews to move to the land of Israel, and it sped up the kibbutz Galias process to an amazing degree. So tonight we'll discuss where that fits into the Mashiach process in the sources, because we can all speculate, that's very nice. But if you see the Vilna Gaon speaking about when this will happen, what will happen, so it carries a lot more weight, because you know then that it's part of the Mashiach process in terms of the Ratzon Hashem. So here in source number seven, which is what we're up to today, which is from Kol Ator. So this was super interesting. When Rav Hillel of Shklov, Rav Hillel Rivlin, was discussing with the Vilna Gaon about the process of Kibbutz Galios and making Aliyah, when he was given his divine mission to return to Yerushalayim and to begin the rebuilding of the land of Israel, he asked him a very important question. So here he says, Sha'alti as pi Rabbeinu. So he asked the Vilna Gaon, Im yehev sharut b'metziyus hagash mislahavir as kol Yisrael b'pam achas l'eretz Yisrael. So if there arose the opportunity to bring the entire Jewish people to the land of Israel all at once. Ketzad lasus. So what should they do? Hare yamdu lafanenu sheilos rabos vikashos ben ogeil asidur yishu. There's going to be many practical issues with how are you going to have, let's say, a million Jews enter into the land of Israel at once. There was no infrastructure. It was a barren desert. There wasn't enough food, water, security, anything to take care of housing. There was nothing to take care of a million Jews. So he said, well, the only one's preparing him for this divine mission. He's expecting perhaps he's going to have crazy siyata deshmaya, and many Jews are going to follow him. So he said, practically, what should I do if that opportunity presents itself? Should I turn them back and say, wait a little bit, give us some more time to build up this infrastructure? Or should he just go for it and say, Hashem will, will foot the bill? So what was, that was his question. Achrei yun rav b'she'ela zu, so after a tremendous amount of introspection on this question, the Gra answered, Im, and this is in the bowl, Im ye efshar lahavir la'eret Yisrael, shishim ribo b'pam achas, if you have the opportunity to move 600,000 Jews to the land of Israel at one time, srichim ze miyad, you have to do it immediately. Come hell or high water, whatever the consequences are, get them into the land of Israel. Why? This number of 600,000, which we know there were 600,000 root souls in the Jewish people, 600,000 males above the age of 20 that left Mitzrayim. So this number, 600,000, This number, 600,000, has tremendous strength, and it has a tremendous level of perfection of Shleimus, to overcome the Satan, the Samach Mem, the Satan, the forces of evil, at the gates of Yerushalayim. The Az Tishtalen Miyad HaGeula, and then the redemption will, sounds like it will happen immediately. Hashlema, the Ananei Shemaya B'derech Nisis. It will happen with clouds of glory in a miraculous way. If you can get 600,000 in one shot to the land of Israel, Mashiach will suddenly open the doors. Right? The floodgates will open, and the process will, it will move. Right? We'll get to Mashiach very, very quickly. So he says, back in the bowl. Yodim anu merosh, ki la umas kol hadvarim hatovim habayim kima kima. So we knew from the beginning, we already know this rule from the beginning, that for all the good things that happen little by little, beikvas meshicha with the akla lagadol shibia rabbeinu kimavor lael, like all like the, like the gra explained earlier, that the process of ikvas meshicha of the footsteps of Mashiach uh, is going to happen little by little gradually. So he says with every gradual step of progress. So the side of evil, the other side, will try to cause stumbling blocks along the way. It'll try to trip us up because it knows that Mashiach means the end of it. That's the end of its life. So it's going to throw some Hail Marys. If you ever see a boxer when he knows he's going down, right? But he wants to maybe try to pull a KO at the last minute, so he starts throwing Hail Marys. So that's what's going to happen with the Sitra Akhra. Right? The forces of evil, they feel that the tide is turning, and Mashiach is about to, about to come. And when Mashiach comes, right, the Gemara and Sukkah says that the Yitzhar is going to be shechted. So it starts making some really intense efforts to try to stop the Jewish people. Huh? Mean, why should he care? I mean, he's a shliach of Hashem. No, he's not, not, he's ready, not, yet. Not, he's not ready yet. Care. We're not ready yet. You'll see. Mm-hmm. And I find now you, but that's, that's too much of a side topic. Let's assume that the Samach Mem Hashem puts him in the world almost with 
his own independent job is to always stop Kedusha from spreading into the world. That's his job. Right? He does care because that's his job. So, so all those things that we, I think we read about like maybe four shiurim ago, we read a Gemara that said that the things that would happen before Mashiach comes, and they sounded terrible. It sounded like there was going to be famine, there was going to be rampant inflation, uh, maybe. Uh, it said that, it said rampant inflation, it said that there was going to be chutzpah yaske, it said that there was going to be no more chachamim, what? <laughs> not, not, by names. not by name, not by name, not by name. Democrats. Demon rats. We said it was going to be the face of the generation. It was going to be like the face of a dog. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, we explained, we tried to give it different explanations. I know you like dogs. Um, so we had a lot of different things that were going to happen that sounded very scary. So he says that when this process continues, so, and it gets very scary, so, well, sorry, when the Sitra Akhra, the forces of evil, feel that the process of Mashiach is coming to fruition and it begins to, 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 to have some success, so it's going to get very, very scary. Right? And all these things, that's when those things in the Gemara are going to begin to occur. Okay, source number eight. Mikan, so here's a, just another source. He learns from different psukim. He says in the, in the Sefer Kolator, Mikan, she kibbutz galios ha'ikari. So we were talking about one of the main jobs of Mashiach, or the process of Mashiach, is what's called kibbutz galios, in gathering of the exiles. He says, Kibbutz Galios Ha'ikari. What does it mean? So the main idea of Kibbutz Galios, who? Lo pachos mi shishim ribo. 600,000. When you, when you pass 600,000, it means you're witnessing Kibbutz Galios. Remember, you have to understand, for 2,000 years, there were like a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand in the land of Israel. For 2,000 years, nobody could settle there permanently. Definitely not in large numbers. The most you had was 20,000, 30,000, max, 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 not even. So... To hear that 600,000 Jews would be living in the land of Israel, right, almost 100 times the amount of Jews that were actually living there, was mind-boggling. 600,000 Jews living in the land of Israel, that's never going to happen. How is that ever going to happen? I see a lot of Jews that were there. So we'll see. We'll see. Millions. What? Now, now there's millions. So we say, okay, source number nine. Okay. Mashiach ben Yosef. Shal yodo kibbutz galios al pi rabbeinu. U b'midash yigdal kibbutz galios. Yisgabra Sitra Achra, like we said, as Kibbutz Galios gets stronger and stronger, the Sitra Achra is also going to get stronger and stronger with its opposition. Ba'az Tosif Gam Kitrugeha Neged Eila She'enam Mechazgim the Kibbutz Galios. And as it gets stronger and stronger, so too will the Kitru, will the accusations in heaven against the Jewish people, specifically those that are not being Mechazek the Kibbutz Galios. So as we're witnessing this tremendous miracle of the Jewish people coming to the land of Israel, so we're obviously expecting that all of the Jewish people are going to support this process, either by physically supporting it, or at least politically supporting it, financially supporting it. But he says that anyone who is not supporting it when it actually picks up steam, there's going to be a kitrug against them, an accusation against them. Since the beginning of Mashiach had already begun, so anyone that doesn't assist in that process, there's going to be an accusation against them. Right? This is like the Jews that we're going to read about very soon in the Kinos, the Jews of Worms and Spire that lived in the ancient communities after the uh, destruction of the first base of Mikdash. They already settled those communities. And when Yerushalayim was being rebuilt, so they were asked to come join. And they say, you go to your big Yerushalayim and we'll stay in our little Yerushalayim. And because of that haughtiness, so they were, those communities suffered tremendously. Many of them were destroyed um, by the Crusades and by pogroms. So when you read through Kinos, it kind of implies that that's the reason that that happened, because they did not take part in the rebuilding of the second base of Mikdash. So too, when Kibbutz Galios, the final rebuilding of the base of Mikdash, is beginning to occur, anyone that doesn't join the effort is also going to have an accusation against them. He And at that point, there will only be a remnant in Sion and Yerushalayim, Ubisridim, Vedai Lahavin, there will only be a remnant, a small amount of Jews that will survive. The Alze Dag Rabbeinu Merod. And about this, the Vilna Gaon was very, very concerned about this part of the process. This part of the process when there'd be accusations against the Jews that were not the Chazik, that didn't strengthen this process of Kibbutz Goyas. <coughs> okay. Now, one more source before I hand out this, this little chart for us. 
So this source is in the Leshem Shavu Ba'achaloma. So the Leshem, we probably mentioned him in a few Shiram ago. So he was a very big Kabbalist, the grandfather, maternal grandfather of Rebel Yashuv. And he writes in his Sefer over here, Amnam, Hinei, Bezor Kadosh, Amr Sham, Od Inyan, Acher, Be'inyan Misas, Rachel, Acher, Shanodu, Kol Hayu Be'ishvatim. So the Zohar mentions a reason why Rachel died after the 12 tribes were born. You have to understand, that was, again, a pro- in terms of the process of the ultimate redemption and moving the world towards its ultimate goal, the, the birth of the 12 tribes was a big deal. It was a big deal. When all 12, 12 tribes were brought into the world, that was the mita shlema, the complete bed, as Chazal put it, of Yaakov Avinu. And that was going to be the forerunner for the entire Jewish nation. It was the seeds of the Jewish people. So he says, the Zohar says, at that point, right, after, right as Yosef is born, uh, sorry, as Benjamin is born, as the last tribe comes into the world, Rachel Imenu dies. So why was it? So it says here in the bold, Shehu mitam ki ka'asher magia ha'es, she ispashes v'izgale ha'shechina ha'kadosha, l'mata b'Yisrael, when the time comes that the shechina will be revealed and will spread out down here in this world within the Jewish people, hide mis'or ha'din b'tchila. Any time there is going to be a revelation of shechina and of godliness in the world, there will be an arousal of din that happens beforehand. So it's really, you see it throughout history when the Jewish people left Mitzrayim and they were about to get the Torah, so Amalek comes and attacks. Right? When Hashem was going to, uh, when the Jewish people were going to re-accept the Torah by Purim, Amalek comes and attacks. A lot of times you see that when, when good things are about to happen to the Jewish people, so if you read through the Torah, there's this Orus Adin, there's a punishment, Hashem gets very strict, he allows the Sitra Achra to sort of try to attempt to stop these things from occurring, and then generally we push through, and the, and the Kedusha is revealed in the world. So, what do we have here? Let's just lay down the pieces that we have. So we have puzzle pieces, we try to put them together based on what the Gura told us in Kolator. So, the process of Mashiach is going to happen little by little, kima kima. As it happens little by little, so the opposition from the forces of evil in the Sitra Achra is going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. Until finally, when we get very close to that number 600,000, that's when it's going to throw the KO punch. Because when you get to 600,000, so at that point, he says, that's when we're going to break the power of the Sitra Achra on the gates of Yerushalayim, spiritually, and that's when the floodgates of Mashiach are going to open. So the Sitra Achra knows that that's a very, very important time. So too, at that time, as Kibbutz Galios is speeding up and more Jews are emigrating to the land of Israel, there will be a kitruk, an accusation against any of the Jewish people that did not join the actual physical Aliyah or that did not support it. So that's another fact that we said. There's going to be a kitruk against them. And the Grah was very, very scared of what would happen at that time. So we see we have the number of the Jewish people growing land of Israel, the number 600,000, and the Kitrug against those that did not join the Aliyah. Okay, so now I have this chart. If you can hand out some on this side of the room. And you can put the extras back here. I think we have a lot of extras here. If you want to hand it out over there. What was that? Isn't certainly, certainly. The question was, when did we get to 600,000 land of Israel? What? So, we'll see what it, what it means. We'll see what it means. What group do, do those who say, I can't afford to move there, just that, that's I have right. a, a, they're just stuck here. That we want to do not, it, but we, but we group, can't afford an apartment. What group are they in? Are they in the one that's dead? I mean, they're going to suffer because of that? So we'll have to, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. We'll, we, yeah, we'll see. So we'll discuss it in a minute. First, we want to see the, the timeline. Okay. So what I did here, this is a graph that I made on, uh, on Microsoft Excel. And what I did was I plotted two, two different numbers. On one axis are the years from 1922 until 2015. And I went on to the census database for the land of Israel and got the population in the land of Israel, the Jewish people, from, it was really from 1815 until 2015. But from 1815 until about 1922, it didn't really change at all. It was like 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. So on a graph that goes up to 650,000, it was pretty much as a straight line, flat across, almost touching the bottom. So as you get to 1922, that was really when the Aliyah, the major Aliyahs began, and significant numbers of Jews were emigrating to the land of Israel, as you know, because there were many anti-Semitic 
um, laws being passed in Europe, so many Jews began making their way to the land of Israel. And there was more economic opportunity, and there were many Jews that were living there at that time. So if you look here on the graph, so 1922, 24, 31, right, you go across, so you see finally things are picking up steam. When you get to if you, about 1945 already, even 1942, you can see 1942, there were 550,000 Jews in the land of Israel. If you look at that little graph, right, the first line across is 500,000. So you see it's a little bit above that in 1942. It was about 550,000 Jews that were in the land of Israel. Now, that's very close to 600,000. So as I was plotting these numbers, I said, okay, so we should see a tremendous push of the Sitra Afra at that point to stop the Jews. A kitrug against the Jews that didn't join the Aliyah, that stayed in Europe and didn't join the, the boat, the, the lifeboats. And after that, we should see the process of Mashiach happened almost in a miraculous way. Almost miraculous. So look at your graph. So 1942, everyone knows that was uh, the heat of the Holocaust. That was the most intense point of the Holocaust, which continued to get worse and worse until 1945. And you see literally 1945, between 1945 and 47, right after the Holocaust, obviously many, grew, many Jews emigrated to the land of Israel, a lot of refugees. That's when we hit the magic number 600,000. And look what happened literally at the moment we hit the number 600,000, the UN gave us the land of Israel. They didn't give us anything. Which we saw in the Vilna Gon that said that Mashiach ben Yosef is going to happen with permission of the Goyim. With the permission of the Goyim. The Gra said that our initial return to the land of Israel will be with the permission of the Goyim, like during the second base of Mikdash, when Cyrus gave the Jewish people permission to go back and build the second base of Mikdash. So the Vilna Gon we saw, I think it was in the first source, that, maybe the second source, that that was gonna happen in the same exact way. That the Goyim were gonna give us permission to go back to the land of Israel, and that's exactly what happened, almost prophetic. Remember, this book was written in, uh, in the early 1800s. So this was telling us all of these things way before they happened. That when the number was gonna to get to 600,000, the Sitra Achra was going to try to stop us. The Jews that were not in the land of Israel were gonna be the ones that truly suffered. Right? There, was no, there was no Holocaust in the land of Israel. Any of the 550,000 Jews that made it um, were pretty safe, pretty much safe, right? The Nazis never made it there. And any of the Jews that did not make it to the land of Israel, specifically those in Europe, so those are the ones that suffered. Not to say that, chas v'shalom, we're not saying that they were punished for that, or many Jews wanted to go, they couldn't go, but we do see that there was a kitruk, that the Sitra Achra and the forces of evil definitely had a part to play. And like the Lechem, the Lechem Shavu Vachaloma said, whenever a great Kedusha is about to be revealed in the world, so then the Kitrug of the forces of evil are going to try to stop it from being revealed. So that's exactly what happened here to get to the number 600,000. And look, it's unbelievable, right after 600, if, if I didn't tell you that the state of Israel was formed, this is probably the most miraculous graph you'd ever see. You're like, what the heck happened in 1948? Look at this graph, for those of you who are there. This graph is amazing. Right? Literally right there, you see, this is a graph of Mashiach. It's a, gra it's a graph of the ingathering of the exiles. And now right when we hit the number 600,000, suddenly things take off in a, in a miraculous way. That's, that's a miraculous graph. If I just extended it out, you could just see all the way from 1800, nothing was happening. <laughs> like flat line, completely across. Finally, a little bit of activity over here, and then poof, Mashiach ben Yosef. That's pretty much what you see on this graph, is this process of Mashiach ben Yosef taking place. So that's just my theory. I think it's as, as clear, as, as good as any theory will ever be, especially when you have it in front of your eyes, that that's what happened. That's what happened. What happened is exactly what was written here in Kola Torah, that the entire process was predicted and that the establishment of the state of Israel was the opening of the gates for the true redemption and the kibbutz Galius. Ischalta de Geula. That was really the beginning of the Geula. And now it's amazing how much further along we are. Here, uh, I mean, if I extended it to 2022, I think there's even more. You should have gone further. Even more growth. It's, 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 yeah, they only, it's on, online, they haven't done a census in a while. So the last one that was available was 2015. So hopefully, I think they're going to do one again soon. Um, but that, that was the last one that was available. So here you see it happening. So, okay, so that was basically the Vilna Gaon's take on what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. Now, we'll try to answer a few questions. And the Vilna Gaon answers other questions as well that people have on this process. Because Satmer says that this process is really the Maisa Satan, that they believe that it couldn't be that the Geula would come through Rishayim. And now you have to understand, those Jews that really were the forerunners to establishing the land of Israel, Menachem, not Menachem Begin, what's his name, with the puffy hair? 
Ben Gurion, Ben Gurion, and uh, many of his Labour Party, the Socialists. So they were rabid uh, anti-Semites. We can even call them. Right? They're super anti-religious. They said that the old Jew of Europe was going to die in the inferno of the Holocaust, and this is going to be a new Jewish people, strong, fit, young, ready to fight, not bogged down by its old archaic religious practices. And any Jew that made it to the land of Israel. Um, can't pass notes in class. It's Golda Meir. Uh, okay. The Golda Meir was also part of the part of their clan. Um, there were a lot of uh, the early leaders of uh, of the non-Jews were. I'm oh, sorry, of the secular Zionist movement were very very anti-religious, very anti-religious. So it was very hard to believe that Mashiach was going to come through the hands of what we would call a, a mumar, a literal an apostate. They were. They had, they grew up in Europe, so you have to understand. They didn't grow up in today's society where they, we call them, many of them, Tinoch Shanishba. They were, uh, you know, almost like babies that were kidnapped by the Goyim because they grew up in a totally non-Jewish culture. They didn't know any better. They never met Jews that really, uh, you know, lived authentic religious lives. So many of these people grew up in very from households. Okay, they might have gotten, uh, they might have not have gotten enough hugs and kisses as children. I don't know what made them go off, but... They were, they were given, you know, they, they, they pretty much knew what Judaism was about, and nevertheless they rebelled because they wanted a free life. They were called fry, in Yiddish they're called free, those that threw off the yoke of the Torah. And they not only wanted to live non-Jewish lives themselves, non-religious lives, but they wanted to stamp out anyone else that was trying to build religious enclaves in the land of Israel, because they did not want it to become a religious state. So that's pretty bad. So Samir and many tzaddikim at the time had a very hard time believing that this was the beginning of Mashiach. How could this be the beginning of Mashiach? To come through people like this. At least when, when, when Cyrus gave us permission to return and rebuild the second base of Mikdash, so it was Ezra and Nehemiah that led the way. Right? There were a lot of uh, ignorant Jews that were living in the land of Israel that they came and they helped them do tshuva, but at least you had tzaddikim that were leading the movement. Here you had the exact opposite. So they were wondering, how could it be? How could it be? <coughs> So if you look over here in source number 12. So source number 12 says in the bowl, Kola Torah, so this again is the Vilna Gaon. Umaisis Satan hu. It's the work of the Satan. Hamastir est chunosab shel Mashiach ben Yosef. It will hide the characteristics of Mashiach ben Yosef. She'ein mechinin be'ikvos Mashiach Sorry, sorry, it's just say makirin. She'ein makirin be'ikvos Mashiach, that the Jewish people will not recognize the footsteps of Mashiach. Ve'gam mezalzelim bahem ba'avonoseinu harabim, and they'll also be mezalzel. They will put down and disparage that beginning of the messianic process and say that it's it's not kosher. It's not kosher. So I forgot the first line actually said that he that the Vilna Gaon says if you look at the beginning of this source. Vayakar Yosef as echav v'heim lo hikiruhu that Yosef recognized his brothers but they didn't recognize him. So he says v'zohi achas mitchunosav shal Yosef v'lo rak v'doro ki im b'chol dor v'dor asher hu Mashiach ben Yosef makir as echav. Every generation, this concept of Mashiach ben Yosef, these individuals that represent Mashiach ben Yosef, they recognize that they're part of the messianic process. The heim lo makir maso, but the Jewish people won't recognize them. So it'll always be someone that he's part of this process, but the Jewish people will actually disparage these people and say, no, we're sure they're not part of the Messianic process. So that's exactly what the Vilna Gaon said was going to happen, that whoever was going to lead this charge was actually going to be uh, illegitimate in the eyes of the Jewish people. So why would that be, though? So again, we still haven't answered why. At least he predicted that that's what's going to happen, that it's going to begin in a way that the majority of the Jewish people will not recognize their brother Yosef. Remember, that's what happened in Mitzrayim, right? Yosef's paving the way for the Jewish people to survive in the land of Egypt, and they don't recognize him, and they think he's this evil ruler, he's an Egyptian monarch, right? He's a dictator, he's terrible, but really it was, his, it was their brother all along that was setting up the ability for them to survive in Gullus. So, so too, Mashiach and Yosef, we're going to look at him like he was Yosef when he was dressed as an Egyptian, like a guy. Mamish, right? Yosef was dressed like a guy. They thought he was evil, he, tried, he was trying to hurt them. Mashiach and Yosef would be the same thing. We'll look at him, and in our eyes, he'll look like he's dressed like a guy, like he's trying to hurt you and kill you. And really, really, he's paving the way and laying the foundation and the groundwork for the process of Mashiach that's going to occur afterwards. So why does it have to happen that way? That's a pretty, like, why does why did Hashem build it in like that? Why couldn't it just be Ezra Nehemiah? Why couldn't it be the tzaddikim that were given permission to 
rebuild the land of Israel and to begin the state of Israel? Why was the state of Israel not, not started by a religious party and by the chief rabbi of Israel? Right? Why, Rav Kook died beforehand, but why was it not Rav Kook? Someone like that. So here, in source number 13, the Vilna Gaon addresses it, as with all of our questions, it was already almost prophetically addressed. So he says, Ikvus Mashiach, Bishvil Shnei Dvarim Nikrim Ikvus, two reasons why it's called the heels, the heels, or the, the, the footsteps of Mashiach. Bishvil Shabayim Kima Kima, one reason, like we said before, it happens little by little, like small footsteps, right, it's not a leap. And number two, Bishvil Shakol Segulos Hagaula, Baos Bederech Akevin Hainu Akifin. All the segulas of the geula, all of this process of redemption, and I guess the landmarks along the way. So, baos b'derech akeven hainu akifin. They come in a roundabout way, in a roundabout way. B'derech shall schar schar, like slipping it in around the back, going through the back door. K'dei shelo yit achzu behem klipos atuma, so that the forces of tuma and sitra achra and evil won't be able to stop it. If the tzaddik goes and tries to conquer the land of Israel, so that you can't imagine the opposition that the forces of evil would give to that conquest. It would never succeed. It would never succeed. So Hashem has to kind of, anytime Hashem wants to bring the biggest kedusha into the world, He has to slip it through the back door. I know this doesn't make sense. Oh, it's Hashem, right? We, like you asked before, the, 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 the Samach Mem, the Sitra Achra, the Satan can stop Hashem. No, but Hashem builds it into the process that He doesn't want to reveal Himself all at once. He wants to make it in a roundabout way. And in that way, he also tests the Jewish people. Are they going to recognize the hand of Hashem? Are they going to say that this is, this can't be from Hashem? Tip the scales. So yeah, he has to keep Bechira, right? Yeah. He, also, he always has to keep Bechira even. So here in source number 14, we see this is not a concept that was invented by the Vilna Gaon. We see Rabbeinu Chaim Vital, the Talmud of the Arizal, already mentions it in Shar HaGilgulim. And he says, The Da, and you should know, Ki la'olam kesha ha'neshama hi gedola me'od. Whenever there's a huge holy neshama that's ready to come into the world, Hashem cannot remove it from the forces of impurity to bring it into the world, without using trickery. Without using trickery. Hashem has to trick the forces of evil to bring holy neshamas into the world. And he writes, and we won't get into the details, you can read it on your own, but that's how the neshama of Avraham had to come through a father that was an Ovid of Zarah. And it said that he was born through a union that took place when uh, Abraham's mother was a Nida. It was the most impure uh, birth that you can imagine spiritually. And it came through a very unrighteous person. And that's how he, Hashem snuck in the neshama of Abraham Avinu, one of the greatest neshamas that ever came into the world. Hashem brings it about in a roundabout way. Right? The neshama of Tavra Melech, the neshama of Mashiach, came through, as we mentioned before, through Rus right? and Boaz. And Rus was... A non-Jew that converted, and everyone said, maybe Moaviot cannot convert into Judaism. Boaz was the only one who possibly that they could. He was a Gadol Ador. So he said, yes, they can convert. And she did marry Boaz. And the night after they got married, Boaz died the next morning. And everyone said, oh, you see, he was totally wrong. He just did it because he wanted that pretty girl. And that's, that, that's probably the rumors that were going around. And that's where Mashiach comes from. Or Yehuda and Tamar, had Yehuda's daughter-in-law dresses like a, like, a, like a harlot and tricks her father-in-law to, to be with her. These weird stories. Uh, and Melech and Bathsheba. Right? All these stories. Hashem, whenever He brings the neshama of Mashiach into the world, or these big neshamas, He has to slip it through the back door. He has to make sure that the Jewish people themselves, when they see these things happening, say, for sure, that's not going to be a good neshama. Tavar Melech was ostracized. Right? He was sent out to the fields because they thought he was a mamzer. When, when, uh, when Shmuel came to anoint the sons of Yishai, so all the sons line up, and he tries each, he checks each one, and none of them, none of them are right. And he says, am I in the right house? Right? <laughs> is, this a, is this the Yishai's address? He says, yeah. He says, do you have any other sons? Ah, oh, there's one other one. We don't like to bring him around. He's kind of, <laughs> he's the embarrassing one. All right, we don't like them to bring him to the table. So he says, okay, go get him. So they get him from the field, the, the, you know, the, the poet that's uh, floating out in the field playing the harp, and they bring him in, and sure enough, he's Mashiach. Right? He's the Mashuach, right? He's the one who's anointed. He's the forerunner of Mashiach. So that's how the process always happens. Because that's the way to bring the ultimate light of Geula into the world. It has to come through the back door. So the greatest light is always going to come through the greatest hastara, through the greatest concealment. So you have to imagine, the ultimate Geula, the final redemption, for sure it's not going to come in a kosher way. In a kosher way, right? It's not going to look kosher, because it can't. This is the light of Mashiach. This is Kibbutz Goliath. This is it. The, the land of Israel, the, the, the Medina, 
for the Medina to have started off with a bunch of tzaddikim, no way, no way Hashem, the Sitra Achra and the forces of evil would have let that happen. Hashem has to sneak through the back door. So he brings in a bunch of Rishayim, literally Rishayim, and he will give them the reins. But you see what happened, uh, you see what happened today, they, uh, Begin, not Begin, Menachem, not Menachem Begin, but again, Ben Gurion. Ben Gurion was going to give permission to 200 yeshiva students to learn full time, and he said, let them learn, there'll be a museum uh, you know, in, in about 50 years about what a yeshiva bacher was, and he thought that it was just going to peter out and die because who wouldn't want to join this strong movement of secular Zionism where we're going to rebuild the land? Who wants to sit and be the weak old Jew that learns in yeshiva? And sure enough, you go to Yerushalayim today, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews learning yeshiva. And even the non-religious Jews are coming around. There's a major movement of tshuva. Uh, the army itself has the majority of the officers in the army are religious today because they're the only ones that still feel that uh, they want to fight for the land of Israel where secular Zionism, Zionism pretty much has died out. They don't, you know, if you're going to fight for the land of Israel, well, it's already built. It's already pretty much a first world country. You're not really building anything anymore. You're just serving in a compulsory draft, which is not very fun. Uh, it's delaying your ability to go to college and earn money. You're paying higher taxes than you do in America. The cost of living is really expensive. Hey, the secular Zionists, they're not so happy to live in the land of Israel anymore. It's not so great. But if you're a religious Zionist, so then of course you're bringing the Geula. You're fighting for the Jewish people. So they obviously are the best fighters. They're the ones that are going to fight with all the hearts until the last drop of strength. So they're almost even taking over the army at this point. That the religious Jews are really the ones that are, that are pushing Israel to the next frontier. And like I said, the majority of the Jewish people are going to be land of Israel. The amount of uh, religious activity is growing and growing. Things are going in the right direction. But they started with the exact opposite. Right? Because Hashem has to sneak in. He has to sneak in this process of Mashiach, he has to sneak it through the back door. So that's what was taking place with the establishment of the land of Israel, the state of Israel. So that's really the thesis behind Kol Ator. It's really amazing. It's almost like the Vilna Gon predicted, and it all really happened in the last hundred years. Meaning from the time that the Tamidi Hagra settled in the land of Israel in the 1800s, there was not a lot of activity from then until the early 1900s. Um, they were building the Yishuv Yashan. there was a religious uh, movement that grew there. There were, there were hundreds of thousands of Jews living there, so to be sure, there was a lot of progress. But what happened in the last hundred years is unprecedented. It's really unbelievable. It's a, it's a miracle. It's the graph that you saw. Hey, this, is, this is unbelievable. If you go, and now every 10 years you go visit the land of Israel, it's unbelievable the progress that's being made. In fact, the Minister of Transportation got up in front of the Knesset and said that the, the plan for public works projects regarding transportation over the next 10 years actually takes into account the Shalosh Regalim. To, to have the ability to get all of the Jews in the land of Israel to Yerushalayim <coughs> for festival, mm -hmm. right, for everybody to get there. So they build all these bullet trains and all these things are all coming into Yerushalayim. They extended Kvish Echad. If you've been there recently, they, they're, they're expanding the highways. They're really preparing for Shalosh Regalim, right? For the pilgrimage back to Yerushalayim. They're getting it, they're getting it ready. If you see the amount of building that's happening in Yerushalayim, they're only, they're only building up now. Right? They have to make so many apartments, right? You have to have all the Jews stay in uh, stay in Yerushalayim, so you have to have a lot more houses, a lot more apartments to stay in. If you go there and you have the right goggles on, if you're wearing Mashiach goggles, so then you see Mashiach happening in front of your eyes. You see everything's getting ready. There's a whole kolol now of Kohanim that practice the avoda on, on um, Kalim in the base of Mikdash built a scale. They build them out of wood. They have a big, you can see it's like, it looks like a field. It's a giant Mizbeach, like full ramp. It's huge. If you saw the real Mizbeach, it's a huge structure. And you see them walking up and they're shechting animals. And they're, they're not, not as karbanos, but they're shechting them and they're practicing. They're practicing, uh, they're practicing all the avodas. Because they say, Mashiach comes tomorrow. Someone needs to know how to do the zrika and how to do, right, have, have to do all the, the avodas. So they're practicing the avoda. They have the, uh, the, I forget, there's some institute that, that actually knows how to build the kalim. They have a paraduma, I've, I've been told now. They have a paraduma. Huh? Mm -hmm. Temple Institute is, uh, is, is going to know it. If you want to build the kalim for the base of Mikdash, I'll do it in two seconds. <laughs> so the Mashiach's here? Okay, we got it ready. Pop it out of the oven. And you have like the kalim for the base of Mikdash. Right? You see that even, even the Jewish people within the land are preparing for something. There's, there's movements preparing. So everything, the table is being set. And again, you want to be part of this process either by supporting it or obviously, ideally, by making Aliyah. That's the way to go. And as Hashem makes the land of Israel, uh, you know, pretty much, a, now it's a first world country, really on par with America. If you go there today, I know when, we, when I was in Yeshiva, you know, 20 years ago, and anyone that's visited 30 years ago, okay, so there's a lot to complain about. It wasn't, it wasn't like living in America. Today, it's literally like living in America. In fact, in my opinion, it's better. Living in Yerushalayim was 
was a dream. It's perfect. Everything's perfect. There's air conditioning everywhere. Right? Uh, there's great transportation. The cost of living is much cheaper. The education's great. The healthcare is great. Everything is pretty much perfect there. So there's almost no excuse, especially if you have a lot of children. So it's more fiscally responsible to live there than here because your healthcare and education are paid for. And they're, probably, they're on a much higher level than they are here, in my opinion, at least what I experienced there. So, so what's the excuse anymore? So as the excuses fall away, so hopefully more people jump on the lifeboats and the ones that don't, Hashem will get everyone there some one way or another. So still, I don't want to wait. It's still too expensive. They're still telling us. Uh, no, it depends nefesh. where you want to live. You stay, stay where you are. No, they don't. Aaron, we're calling them together. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna discuss. It's not right, so right. easy. It's you not live easy. in NMB. You can sell your house for a million dollars now. Right? You can sell your apartment for two hundred thousand. You can go live. You can go live on any. You can go live in the north. You can go live in the south. You can buy a beautiful apartment. For, for uh, you go. You go to land of Israel. You see, there's, there's cheap places to live. I mean, your shalim is expensive, but even your shalim, I'm saying, it's not. It's not more expensive than living in downtown Miami. Thousand shekels a month. Yeah, I think three thousand shekels a month. So right now is the time to. To, to, to get on the boats. Um, and we see that the process is happening before our eyes. So keep an eye on it. Watch as the majority of the Jewish people for the first time in 2,000 years are going to be in the land of Israel. The Kedusha is going to come uh, back on a Daraisa level. You didn't see it, Israel shortly, before, shortly after the Six-Day War. Because what happened in the Six-Day War was such, such impossible miracles. Literally impossible. I can tell you things that, that happened over there. We were on the radio. Like, yeah, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't around that, was but the most, it hurt. It, it was impossible. It could never, never occur anywhere else. That was probably also one of the greatest yeah. miracles. We saw open miracles. And the changes the that took place right? since that time. You know, all of a sudden, this whole Friar country that hated Yiddishkeit, and they hated Yiddishkeit. They, 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 did, they did so many things to try to, to destroy Tefillin and, uh, from, and, and take away yeshivas. And, and all of a sudden, you see these very same people. All of a sudden, they start wearing kippot, and they start going to the kaisal. That's when that's when Eish, the Torah began, and, 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 just, and uh, Dera and Or Sameach. Like, like yeah. suddenly, like somebody snapped their fingers, and you know, I was there, and I saw all these things, and I went, and I and I went, you know, so many times after since 1969, 1970. Every time you go back. A little more. It, like it, it changes. So next time you go back, you gotta stay. You're not allowed, we're not letting you leave. But, uh, <laughs> but as you go, okay. So that that's what's happening now. Yeah, questions. Just They'll kick me out. Um, was President Trump? I know he's not a common person, but was he part of like this messianic? Um, I mean, every, everything right now is part, of, is part of the process. Everything is part of the process. So certainly if there's a president that was probably the greatest friend of Israel you know, ever and the president of the United States, so I'm sure that was moving us in the right direction. In terms of right now, we're, we're, we're building up the land of Israel. So any person that gives permission to build on more land, that's probably the greatest friend to Israel in terms of bringing the Shia is Yishu of Eretz Yisrael. That's the big name of the game right now. The more we can develop there, the more we can build the infrastructure, so the more ready Mashiach is going to be. So any president that allows us to build and to expand, that is as good as it can get. That, that's, what we, that's all we ask for. When Begin gave back the Sinai and Sharon gave back the Gaza, was that counterproductive for the Yiddish type of getting the Mashiach back? So we'll discuss this next time. We'll discuss a wild story that happened after the Six Day War and about Jews giving back land, um, and if that is counterproductive, if we're allowed to for peace, if there's a whole halachic uh, discussion that needs to take place there, but we'll discuss the messianic implications. Um, and probably it did, it did hold us back because what was happening, anytime we capitulated is because we believed that the Goyim were in control as opposed to Hashem, that the non-Jewish nations were the ones that were granting us our freedom and were giving us victory in the wars and all their arms and their money and that it wasn't Hashem. And after the Six Day War, that was a pretty crazy mistake to make when you saw miracles taking place and you think it's America that helped us win the war, that we have to kind of bow to them. So that was a big mistake. And maybe we did delay Mashiach, but in the end of the day, retrospectively, it's all from Hashem. Lev Malachim Biyad Hashem, that the heart of kings is in the hands of Hashem. There's only a few people in the world that don't have free will. You know that? Right? Uh, there's a big cloud. Everyone has free will. You know who doesn't have free will? Presidents, dictators, and kings. Anyone that's in control, uh, right? it says that anyone that has a din of a king that's in control of the world, so Hashem has to run the world through them. He kind of moves the geopolitical uh, pawns into place to move the world. So Hashem is in control of the kings. So if a prime minister decided that he's not going to uh, continue moving forward and conquering more land, they're going to give back land, that's all Hashem operating through him behind the scenes, but it still can come through the mistake. Obviously, there's still, there's still a decision that was made, 
but um, and that was came from the wrong place, perhaps. But it's all Hashem, so don't worry. It's all part of the process, and retrospectively, we'll eventually see what.